네, 3일 동안 진행되는 보험 컨퍼런스의 핵심 방향성 및 주제를 알려주는 기조 연설은 노스캐롤라이나 대학교 심리신경과학과 교수이신 바버라 프레드릭슨 학사님께서 해주시겠습니다. 교수님께서는 본 행사의 핵심 키워드라고 할수 있는 명상에 대해 십수년간 연구를 해오셨는데요. 130편이 넘는 연문을 포함해 저서에는 2009년도에 파지티비티, 2013년도에 러브가 있으며 전 세계 20개 이상의 언어로 번역되었습니다. 이렇듯 인류의 웰빙 향상을 위한 교수님의 노력 및 업적은 2017년 심리학 분야의 탕 프라이즈를 수상하게끔 했는데요. 지금 교수님께서 계신 지역은 늦은 밤임에도 불구하고 여러분들을 위해 실시간으로 기조 연설 및 질의응답에 함께 해 주실 것입니다. 과연 명상이 우리의 감정, 사회적 유대관계 및 건강에 어떠한 영향을 미치는지 함께 경청해 보도록 하겠습니다. 네, 교수님을 모시겠습니다. 헬로 And uh, I'm so honored to be part of your event. And I am delighted to be able to share with you the research that my team and I have been carrying out on the benefits of meditation, various uh, styles of meditation. And um, just one moment while I open my slides and share a screen. pay my um, thanks and uh, respect to my team who has helped me carry out this research. This is, um, I work in a lab group that I call the Positive Emotions and Psychophysiology Laboratory or the PEP Lab. And um, this, uh, you know, in beautiful non-distanced form is a previous version of my lab. And this is the 2020, 20, 21 version of my lab where we meet pretty much just on Zoom. And I also want to thank the funding agencies in the United States that have supported this work, much of it from the um, National Institute of Health. Now, um, we've been through a lot this past year or more. And, you know, we've certainly grown from having to stay at home to being able to in, enjoy um, some things in person and even uh, socially distanced dance. I thought that was beautiful. Um, and yet the limitations on our life have been a, a big challenge, a big challenge to people's mental health. A lot of people, um, especially in my country and I think all over the world and a lot of distress, uh, very lonely, some very isolated. And in the context of the difficulties that we've been through, it can seem completely out of place to just be discussing the benefits of positive emotions. My entire research career has been focused on positive emotions. And this is a, a very um, overly American version of positive emotions. And I want to point out that it's not what we'll be talking about. Um, there is a big concern in the past year with toxic positivity, um, positivity that is not um, healthy. And this guy's a good representation of that. Um, the key here is that um, his happiness is completely inappropriate to the context. He's got no parachute. He's just falling from the sky. Why is he smiling? There's really no reason. So it's very important that our positive emotions be fitting the situations that we're in and also that they not be a mask for uh, a more troubled inner state. So again, this is um, one concern people have is that especially um, when there's social pressure to feel or express a particular emotion, and maybe that characterizes the United States more than 
uh, South Korea, but um, that people will um, wear a smile like makeup or a uniform and it's not a, a genuine state. So one thing we can we know from the research is that positive emotions are useful and yet they need to be appropriate to the context and authentic to our inner states. And so in the context of a pandemic, um, one way to think about uh, positivity is not masking negativity, but holding it side by side, holding positivity and negativity side by side. And in fact, the one of my favorite definitions of hope is fearing the worst and yearning for better, fearing the worst outcome and yearning for better. And the, the value of the yearning for better is that that yearning unleashes people's capacity to try to create that better future. So hope motivates. Um, and we also know that with mental health, most people wake up in the morning with at least mild positivity. And that's what allows us to get out of bed in the morning. When positive emotions recede entirely from our daily experience, it's hard to be motivated to do anything. So we need to understand the value of emo emotions, all emotions, especially positive emotions better. And that's my key perspective that I bring to the science of meditation. I have studied and written about um, 10 different positive emotions. Um, these are ones that people experience most frequently. There are other positive emotions, but these are the ones that um, are fairly common. Um, joy, hope, pride, interest, gratitude, inspiration, serenity, amusement, love, and awe. I wrote about these in my book, Positivity, and one of my readers created this quilt for her granddaughter and um, graciously allowed me to use it as my list of positive emotions. And one thing that I really wanna emphasize about emotion experience, and this is why they went unstudied by Western science for nearly a hundred years. Psychology has been around for more than a hundred years about 120 years. And for the first 100 years, no, hardly anybody studied emotions. The reason is because they're short-lived. Um, an emotion lasts seconds. So it rises up like a wave and dissipates. And for that reason, many people considered them to be rather trivial um, because they're short-lived. The other thing to keep in mind about emotions is that they're not just things that go through our minds. They are, um, by definition, a mind and body experience. This is a representation of a survey given to more than 700 individuals. And those individuals were asked, where in your body do you feel energized or de-energized? when you feel a particular emotion. The energized areas of the body are um, red and yellow. The de-energized areas of the body are blue to white. And so you can see for the emotion of sadness, our limbs <laughs> become a liability. They become a, a drag. <laughs> and, um, but for anger, say, there's a lot of energized, experiences in the hands and the head and the heart and the upper torso. For happiness here, which is one of the few positive emotions they looked at, there's an energized feeling throughout the body, especially in the head and the heart. So emotions, again, are a full body experience, an embodied experience. They're fleeting and they affect our bodies. And it's for that reason that they affect our, our health and our our social connections. So um, as I mentioned, I've written about um, the progress in my research 
lab on positive emotions in two books. Um, Positivity um, describes the, the effects of positive emotions on individuals. And my book, Love 2.0, has a special focus on the positive emotions that we co-experience with others, that we collaboratively experience together. And this broaden and build framework provides kind of a a structure uh, for a lot of the research that I'll share with you. So I want to just give you the um, a quick overview of that so that you can appreciate some of the, the later science that I'll share. The broaden and build theory suggests that positive emotions have a particular form which serves a particular function. And the particular form is that they open our awareness. So just like this uh, water lily opens and closes with the presence and absence of sunlight, Brain imaging studies, eye tracking studies, behavioral studies show us that the human brain opens and closes with the presence and absence of positive emotions. What this means is that those fleeting positive emotional states fundamentally change the way the human brain works, allowing us to see the bigger picture, connect disparate ideas, and um, deal with big picture um, uh, problems. And the reason that those moments of open awareness matter is that they function as nutrients, nutrients that help us to grow and become better versions of ourselves, more resourceful, more resilient, more socially connected, And so just like, you know, in terms of um, nutrition, we can't just eat one uh, piece of broccoli in a week and expect to be healthy. We need to have a rich daily diet of fruits and vegetables to be healthy. The same is true for our emotions, that we need to have a, a rich variety of positive emotions, all those positive emotions I listed on the, or that were listed on the quilt um, to be uh, our healthiest selves, our most resilient selves. And the reason these, these resources, having more of these resources, resilience, social connections and so on, um, in turn affect the emotions we feel next creating an upward spiral that helps support our flourishing, um, uplifted mental health um, over time. And positive emotions we've also been able to show are a key ingredient in resilience, resilience in difficult times um, and and we've replicated this effect during the pandemic that the resilient people among us during the early months of the pandemic were the ones who were able to self-generate more authentic, contextually appropriate positive emotions, both individually and together with others. Now, I've argued um, for many years that positive emotions uh, uh, function as a nutrient for growth as a way for us to become our our, uh, better selves. And in my book, Love 2.0, I argue that among all the positive emotions, there's one positive emotion that stands above the others and is perhaps even more nutritious for us. And that is the emotion of love, which I define as an emotion a short-lived state where we co-experience positive emotions with other people. Because when we do this, when we laugh with a friend or a child, our positive emotion and their positive emotions resonate um, between, uh, between us in a way that allows them to become a little more intense and a little more prolonged. So positivity resonance, our shared positive emotions are um, 
especially vital for our well-being and especially vital for our resilience. So um, they might occur, you know, um, with close friendships or family members, but they also occur at, at work as people celebrate each other's successes. They also occur when we support one another with compassion, because even though when people are suffering and, and we're offering social support, the most obvious emotion is the negative emotion, the pain, the loss, or the hurt. There's also a thread of shared positivity that runs through that moment. Because when we're suffering and somebody else comes towards us and, le and listens to us, that feels good. That feels like a relief. And when we're able to offer that kind of support to others, we can feel that we've accomplished something good, that we've contributed good. And so even though suffering is the most um, salient emotion, there's a thread of positivity that runs through that as well. Um, the best example I think of uh, shared positivity is the kind that you have with, a, with an infant because there's the words don't get in the way. And if you um, are connecting with a child of this age, you know you need to do it with your face and the way you're moving and, and with great attunement to what the baby is feeling. Because if you come on too strong, the baby will cry. Or if you don't react at all, the baby will cry. And so you need to find that way of meeting them right in the middle with a dance of synchronized nonverbal behavior and positivity. And developmental psychologists have shown how vital those kinds of moments are for infant development. Um, we know how vital they are because they are absent when a caregiver is depressed. Depressed caregivers don't mimic the smiles of the children in their charge. They don't get into this, you know, dance of nonverbal synchrony. And the after effects of being raised by a depressed caregiver go into adolescence. They affect social development and cognitive development and academic achievement decades later. So humans need this positive connection in order to, in order to survive. So how do we create more of it? And this is where I got interested in studying meditation. Honestly, I began studying meditation in order to test theories about what happens if people increase their daily diets of positive emotions. And I first started in that line of scientific testing with interventions that just failed. <laughs> and then I became acquainted more with meditation and Richie Davidson and other people, John Kabat-Zinn began doing rigorous science on meditation. And that served as an inspiration for me that I could use meditation as an, you know, an ancient, well-honed strategy for shifting our emotional experiences. And so um, I, I began studying loving kindness meditation in particular, because that has a focus on self-generating warm and tender feelings towards the self and other, others. And we learned that if you take novices and, and give them a free meditation workshop and encouragement and structural support for um, learning to meditate with guided meditations um, in a, in a six-week in-person group workshop, that's the format that we worked with, that um, the orange um, squares here are those who were randomly assigned to have a six week meditation workshop versus serve in a control condition that was um, on a wait list. They learned meditation later after the study was over. And um, what we saw was that as people um, progressed in their meditation workshop, 
their positive emotions increased. Whereas those who are in the control condition pretty much stayed the same. Now I want to point out the numbers here are very small. This is not a wild increase in positive emotions. It's a subtle increase. But what's important is that this subtle increase in positive emotions cascaded and affected people um, in um, significant ways. Um, um, this is, uh, there was another study that we did that wasn't the, the first, very first study on meditation from which this um, figure is drawn. The participants were um, employees, midlife employees at a computer company in Detroit. <laughs> so these were people who, you know, had a lot of stress in their life. They were working and healthy. Um, in this study, I paired up with a colleague of mine who studies schizophrenia, in particular, people with schizophrenia who are troubled, especially by the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Now, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia are the, are the add-ons, the things like delusions and hallucinations and um, uh, erratic physical movement. Those are the positive symptoms, the things that we see. The negative symptoms are, is the withdrawal from social interaction and the flattening of emotions and the, um, the reduction in speech. And these uh, are not very well treated by medication. The positive symptoms of schizophrenia can get better with medication. The negative symptoms are often um, un unabated with um, medication and traditional treatments for schizophrenia. And so my colleague saw some of our earliest, saw me present um, some of our earliest work that showed that one of the ways that that subtle increase in positive emotions changed people is that it, um, it allowed them to better anticipate future positive events to savor good things in advance. And that is exactly what people who have schizophrenia and the negative symptoms don't do. They, they enjoy good things when they're right in the middle of them, but it, it's like they forget what they enjoy. And so they're not motivated to do anything. And so in this study, we um, uh, recruited a group of um, individuals with schizophrenia with the negative symptoms and measured the intensity of those negative symptoms before and after they took a six week meditation workshop on loving kindness meditation. And there, there, there were two things that were remarkable about that study. No, almost nobody dropped out, which is very unusual for, for this kind of clinical sample. And they showed improvement in their negative symptoms, meaning they experienced more positive emotions, were able to anticipate positive emotions better, and they were more social. And so um, it's a way of improving the well being of individuals who um, are you know, living with a, a serious psychopathology. Um, in our going, returning to our um, sample of uh, in our very first studies where we had um, midlife um, working adults, we found that that subtle increase in positive emotions predicted increments over time in a number of resources, including people's cognitive resources like their mindfulness. Their, it, we saw improvements in their social resources, like their um, feelings of being supported by others. We improved their psychological resources, including their resilience to adversity. And um, we improved their physical resources in terms of people were reporting fewer headaches, aches, pains, colds, and flus. So the, these were all um, based on surveys, um, given before people started the, the were randomized to either learn meditation or not. And then three months later. 
So the people aren't saying I changed. <laughs> We're measuring. They're they're measuring. They're reporting on their experiences, and those survey scales um, indicate that there was a change for the positive. Now, um, together with uh, another um, psychologist who studied meditation quite a bit, Eric Garland and his colleagues, we've created a model to help explain how meditation and particularly mindfulness meditation improves people's well-being. Um, so a big piece of this is that, you know, day-to-day -day stress, Mindfulness allows you to decenter or step back from feeling kind of self-absorbed or caught up in that stress and just being able to observe it more, um, uh, more from a, a more distant stance. That allows people to broaden their awareness, to reappraise stressful experiences in ways that you might see the benefit in them. So, you know, having all this time uh, staying at home in the early months of COVID, some relationships got better. People got to spend more time with their children. Um, and some of that brought people closer. And so those that being able to step back from difficulty and find the good in it can be a support for positive emotions allows people to you know savor those experiences and and see how they contribute to a meaningful life so you know being able to have that big picture thinking that positive emotions enable helps um, people kind of step out of the stress and see the good in a way that brings meaning and purpose to life that increases well-being We've also found in our studies, and this was a very recent report, that meditation improves people's um, social motives. They're more likely to feel drawn to be with people rather than, um, and drawn to experience the good things with other people rather than feeling like they just wanna avoid embarrassing themselves <laughs> having so they have more social approach motives rather than social avoidance motives in ways that um, you know past research has shown that these social approach motives are associated with uh, mental health and good relationships so we also find in a number of studies um, several studies um, with hundreds of research participants that when people learn either loving kindness meditation or mindfulness meditation, it warms up their social connections in the rest of their day. So it doesn't just lead to good feelings while you're meditating or even just in the next 20 minutes after you finished meditating, that it, 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 it runs through all interactions for the rest of the day and allows people to more warmly connect with one another. And we've seen this both inside and outside of work. Um, so sometimes these warmer connections are happening with work colleagues. Um, and the degree to which these social connections become smoother and warmer is related to how many minutes people meditate. Um, and not necessarily just meditated that day, it's also meditated, how many minutes they meditated in the past month predicts the degree of warmth in your, in your social relationships. And we also find um, in our uh, more detailed statistical analyses is that there's a dose response relationship between the frequency and duration of your meditation practice and the emotional and social benefits that you experience. And that is evident both as individual differences between people. So the, those individuals who meditate more frequently and longer have bigger emotional and social benefits, 
but it's also a dose response relationship that's seen within individuals over time. So, and this is the, the aspect that's actually more motivating and hopeful, I think, for individuals that if we go into a season where we're meditating longer and more frequently, the research shows that your emotions will improve, your positive emotions will improve, and your social relationships become warmer. We, in our studies, we don't see a big effect on negative emotions, very small effects on negative emotions. Negative emotions are going to be part of our lives because life is, brings us ups and downs. But what we seem to have more control over is meeting those negative emotions with more positive emotions. And that, that increased ratio of positive to negative emotions is what helps people get on these upward spirals towards more sustained mental health, flourishing mental health. So just like, you know, the uh, taking more exercise makes us healthy, taking uh, uh, more fruits and vegetables makes us healthy, taking more minutes of meditation increases your well-being. Now, more recently, my team and I have been studying um, uh, who benefits the most from um, meditation. And we have found that people who score low on resilience um, are the ones who show the biggest benefits. And that's, they, they arguably could benefit more than the people who are already high in resilience. And similarly, we find that people who are, um, insecurely attached based on their childhood experiences with their parents. Um, those people who feel a little anxious in all of their relationships, like maybe they're not good enough or that someone might leave them or, or um, disparage them. Or the other kind of insecure, which is avoidant. Um, you're just avoiding relationships because they maybe historically felt like not a safe place, that people who have these various forms, especially the anxious attachment, benefit more from uh, mindfulness meditation in particular. So some individuals benefit more than others, and we can capture that with self-report surveys of personality differences in attachment and resilience. We also find that some people benefit more than others. And we can um, note that difference. It's more of a biological individual difference. So we've looked at cardiovascular individual differences and in particular cardiac vagal tone. Your vagus nerve um, emerges from your brain stem and connects your brain to your heart and other internal organs. And um, when your vagus nerve, one of the jobs of your vagus nerve is to slow your racing heart if you become startled or frightened. But um, on a more general everyday basis, the vagus nerve also um, just keeps our human heart rates lower uh, than they might be otherwise. Um, it, it kind of maintains calm. And so that shows up in a very subtle variability in heart rate. And that variability in heart rate is entrained with respiration. So that when we breathe in, our heart rate speeds up. And when we breathe out, our heart rate slows down. That's a very efficient way to bring oxygenated, freshly oxygenated blood into our system. Um, and so, Cardiac vagal tone is one biological individual difference we've looked at. And we've looked also at um, uh, genetic polymorphisms in um, particular um, uh, genes that are associated with um, oxytocin. Um, and we predicted that people who would have potentially have more oxytocin circulating in their bodies would benefit in particular from loving kindness meditation. 
And so um, uh, we measured that through um, blood assays and um, looked at the oxytocin receptor gene, one particular SNP of that. And so I just wanna show you the data that, you know, not everybody benefits the same way from meditation. There are individual differences that predict who's likely to benefit the most. Now, both of these studies, in this first study, we randomized people to learn loving kindness meditation or not. So this was a study that only had two groups randomized. And so um, people who started the study with higher levels of this cardiac vagal tone, more heart rate variability, um, it, higher vagal tone is like muscle tone, having more of it is good. P and if people had higher levels of heart rate variability and had been randomly assigned to um, learn meditation versus not, they experienced a bigger increase in positive emotions. Whereas though those individuals with the lowest vagal tone hardly showed any benefit to their positive emotions at all from loving kindness meditation. Now we saw something similar with this um, uh, particular um, polymorphism of the oxytocin receptor gene. And here was a study where we had um, taught people either uh, by random assignment, either loving kindness, they got loving kindness training, that's why that's um, LKT, or mindfulness training. And um, then we looked at whether they had particular, um, oops, sorry about that, particular um, polymorphisms in this oxytocin receptor gene. And in particular, this GG allele pattern was one that showed the biggest changes with respect to learning loving. Those individuals with that particular genetic polymorphism, when they were randomized to study um, or to learn loving kindness meditation, they showed increases in positive emotions over the six weeks of the study. Those same people with that same genetic profile, but who got mindfulness training, showed no increase in their positive emotions. So there seemed to be a match <laughs> between um, people's biological individual differences and which practice was more emotionally rewarding for them. So um, people will vary and that may depend on um, what they show up with biologically as individual differences or what they show up with in terms of uh, emotional traits like attachment and uh, resilience. Now, um, I want to turn to the ways in which meditation changes us is not just something we can pick up on surveys. We can also pick it up in biomarkers of health. This is the kind of research that really helps build the case that we're doing things to improve our well-being and our health when we meditate. And that can be picked up in objective measures. So um, one, um, going back to the study where we measured cardiac vagal tone, we found that uh, this, this, um, the, this is a frequency of, that describes change in this heart rate variability over the course of a study. It's a six week meditation workshop. So this is before and after the meditation workshop. If we subtract the baseline from the post um, study uh, rating of heart rate variability, we see that those in the loving kindness meditation group showed a shift towards improved vagal tone relative to the control group. And the reason this is important is that um, people um, often presumed that cardiac vagal tone is kind of like your height once you're an adult, it doesn't change very much. This shows that it does change. And um, it changed in step with the degree to which people experienced increased positive emotions and increased warmth in their social connections. And it did not relate to changes in respiration or just a biological change. It, it changed in step with the psychological shifts. And 
Another reason this is important is heart rate variability is associated with the body's ability to regulate the heart, regulate the immune system, regulate glucose. Um, if we uh, have a heart attack, our cardiologist wants to know what our cardiac vagal tone um, is because it predicts our recovery. Um, so this is a marker that relates not just to our ability to get the most out of meditation, but also our, our body's ability to stay healthy. Another biomarker that my team and I have looked at is um, uh, telomeres, um, uh, which are the end caps on our chromosomes and a marker of cellular aging. And um, again, this is viewed as a marker of cellular aging because these end caps on our chromosomes tend to wear away the older we get. Um, but it's not inevitable. You can slow down the erosion of these um, uh, end caps on our chromosomes in a way that seems to be related to slowing down cellular aging. Now, this was a study where we had three different groups, all randomized. People were randomized, again, novice meditators, randomized to learn mindfulness meditation, or loving kindness meditation, or to serve in a waitlist control group. Now, over the course of about two to three months, we saw some um, reductions in telomeres um, that would be uh, reflective of what you would just see over time. And we didn't see any difference between mindfulness and the control group, but we did see a lessening of the erosion of the end caps of these telomeres for those who were randomized to the loving kindness condition. So there seemed to be a benefit at the level of cellular aging that was associated with loving kindness meditation. Now in this particular study, we did not have, um, we didn't see that emotions in particular accounted for the, the biological shift. Um, so there's a bit of a mystery as to what exactly was accounting for this biological shift, but the, the shift itself was reliable. We've also looked at gene expression in the immune system in our white blood cells. And in particular, there is a established profile of leukocyte gene expression that has been very clearly linked to adversity. Things like growing up in poverty, um, uh, losing a spouse, um, enduring chronic adversity. And that leads to a shift in um, immune functioning towards an increased expression of pro-inflammatory genes together with a reduced expression of antiviral synthesis genes. And so it's like with extreme adversity, our immune system gets a double hit. Um, we get less good at fending off viruses like coronavirus or the common cold. Um, and we get more likely to have problems with chronic inflammation. And inflammation is good for during acute stress and for dealing with wounds, but as a chronic state is not very healthy. So we looked at whether being um, learning a meditation technique could maybe reverse this gene expression profile that is associated with ill health and aver adversity. And we had predicted that loving kindness meditation um, might especially be useful in reversing this pattern of gene expression because past research had found that people who had childhood adversity showed this um, unhealthy pattern of gene expression in midlife most of the time, but there was a subset of pe people who endured childhood adversity who didn't show this effect. And those were people who had really 
warm and attuned parents. And so we thought, well, maybe if people learn to be warm and attuned to themselves through loving kindness meditation, that might serve as a, uh, some, a, in, a way to induce health. We actually didn't find that. We found the opposite. We randomly assigned people to learn mindfulness or loving kindness. And we found that the mindfulness group improved this pattern of, I'm sorry, improved this pattern of um, uh, gene expression. Um, remember that the pattern of gene expression is associated with adversity and ill health. So higher bars here mean worse health lower bars means improvements. And so you might notice that the loving kindness meditation, the people who were randomly assigned to learn loving kindness didn't do so well in this study. We have a um, speculation that this was a group who really endured childhood hardship, and it may be especially difficult to focus on warm uh, connections and meditation if you haven't experienced that much in life. Um, and so there could be kind of a, um, uh, kind of a backfiring effect of loving kindness meditation, potentially in, the, in um, uh, people who have endured a lot of adversity in, in, in childhood. There are other health benefits that we've uncovered related to uh, meditation that don't have to do with biomarkers, but have to do with health behaviors. And in particular, we found that looking at studies where people were randomly assigned to learn either mindfulness meditation or loving kindness meditation, we find that mindfulness meditation in particular is linked to um, having longer bouts of exercise when people are, are being physically active in daily life. So we did a, this was as people were going through this six week meditation workshop, they um, completed a nightly report, a nightly survey. And in that nightly survey, we asked, you know, have you been physically active today? Have you engaged in moderate or vigorous physical activity? And if they said yes, we asked how long. And we find that people who had been randomly assigned to um, practice mindfulness meditation were active for longer. They also tended to experience more enjoyment while they're physically active. So this is perhaps why they can um, sustain physical activity because the mindful awareness that they've begun to cultivate allows them to enjoy the physical activity more. We found no parallel effects for loving kindness meditation for the benefits for the health behavior of exercise. Now I want to also mention that in our studies, we have uh, in these six week meditation workshops, we, um, you know, the instructors for them are very experienced meditation instructors who've been teaching for decades. And they convinced me that we, we shouldn't just teach people formal meditation, um, sitting meditation. We should also instruct people in informal meditation. So um, the kinds of really miniature practices that you do within the flow of daily life rather than taking time away from other activities to sit on the cushion and practice meditation in a formal way. So informal meditation would be while you're um, waiting in line uh, or waiting for the microwave to, cook, to warm your lunch, you just take a few mindful breaths. Or um, as you're walking in from uh, you know, the train to work or something, you see somebody else in the distance and you wish for them to have a good day. You extend loving kindness to another, just briefly informally. So we ask people in their end of day surveys, not only did you practice meditation today in a formal way, we ask, did you engage in any informal meditation? And if they said yes, we ask them how frequently. 
And what we found was there was also a dose response relationship here. The more people engaged in informal meditation on a daily basis, the more their positive emotions increased and the more their social connections with others in, in their daily life warmed up. And this is above and beyond the benefits of formal meditation. So it's an independent added effect of the informal meditation. And this study was important because there's very little scientific evidence about the value of informal meditation. Practitioners say that it matters, <laughs> but this is the first scientific study with randomization to be able to show that it matters. And another thing that matters, um, and this is the last study I'll share with you because I know it's, uh, 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 I may have gone over time here, um, is that prioritizing the positive experiences of meditation, whether it's mindfulness or loving kindness, there's threads of positivity that run through those practices. The more we lean into those, um, the better, um, the, the more impact that meditation can have on us. So I represent this as, you know, of all the activities you could put in your day, do you privilege or prioritize the ones that include an uplift of positive emotions? Um, and the reason I got interested in this is that in the very first study that I showed um, to you where those who were randomized to meditate showed an increase in positive emotions. We went back to these individuals 15 months later and asked them whether they were still meditating. And what we learned was that this particular um, increase didn't describe anybody in the sample, really. It was an average of two groups. It was an average of the people who stuck with it and those who didn't. And it turns out that the people who 15 months later were still meditating, if we looked back at their emotions over the course of the study, they showed a significant increase in positive emotions right from the very first week. And those who didn't stick with meditation didn't look much different than the control group until the very last week. So it seemed like this early increase in positive emotions predicted sticking with it. And so we did a study where we um, tried to get people, we randomly assigned people to um, think more about structuring their time to increase positive emotions or to lean in. And we did this by randomly assigning them to read one science article or another. And the, the key thing is that all the evidence we talked about in this uh, lecture and in, in, in other research um, is what was the content of the article, that when making uh, decisions about how to spend your time, we should think about experiencing positive emotions, not forcing yourself to feel positive emotions, but considering it as important to our day as eating uh, fruits and vegetables and staying active. And we find there's a, uh, there was a, a whole theory that we developed called the upward spiral theory of lifestyle change. I'm not going to go into this detail now, um, but we find that if that people who um, meditate experience positive emotions, but even more so if they prioritize positivity. And in particular, um, if we randomly assign people to either think about increasing the positive emotions or not, those who did meditated more over the next three weeks. Um, uh, it, they increased their frequency of meditation and which was an additional 10 minutes per week. So what's key here is that just leaning into the positivity a bit more helps us to sustain our practice so prioritizing positivity matters in that way. Um, I just wanted to point out if you're interested in learning more about the research uh, by my team, there's a free online course that is on Coursera that um, goes through this material in uh, much more detail. And um, I just wanted to say that the, the 
time and energy you put into your meditation practice pays, pays off in terms of shifts in emotions, shifts in social connections, and in biomarkers of health. So I appreciate your, um, your attention and I apologize for going a bit over. 네, 박사님 영광이 감사드립니다. Thank you, Dr. Fredericks, for your excellent presentation. Uh, as a visual learner, I really like your presentation full of all the pictures and images. I think it's really an intuitive and effective way to deliver scientific messages to the general public. Okay, now I will go back to Korean, okay? Okay. <웃음> 예, 이제 Q&A 세션을 어, 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 일단 수많은 질문들을 뒤로 하고 제가 진행자이다 보니까 그 특권을 활용해서 제가 먼저 저의 질문을 하도록 하겠습니다. 자, 요즘 연구를 할때 많은 분야에서 핵심 키워드가 바로 어, personalized medicine이라고 해서 맞춤형 의학이라고 하는데 어, 우리가 심리학에서도 아니면 명상에서도 맞춤형 의학 컨셉이 적용되는 게 너무 신기했어요. 그래서 과연 명상을 통해서 누가 더 효과를 볼수 있는지 그거를 예측할 수 있다는 점이 너무나 신기했는데 어, 물론 뭐 resilience scale이라든가 뭐 유전자형이라든가 여러 가지 바이오 마커들이 있겠지만 그 중에서도 일반인들이 특별한 어떤 그런 측정 없이 아 그래 나는 명상을 통해서 효과를 잘볼수 있는 사람이야 라고 알수 있는 조금 더 쉬운 방법이 있을까요? Yeah, um, it's a, that's a great question. And fortunately, by nature's design, we have this beautifully built-in biofeedback called emotions. <laughs> and it's um, as we practice, those who benefited the most over time were ones who the, the practice of either mindfulness or loving kindness led to increases in contentment, in interest, in awe. Not necessarily, you know, jump for joy, um, feelings, but just subtle shifts in our emotional state. So when we become attuned to those subtle emotional states and those start to shift, we can use that as our measure of whether this is beneficial to us. So we can rely on to our five senses or even six senses, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is, 자, 이제 두 번째 질문으로서는요, 어떤 게 있었냐면, 어, 교수님 발표 중에서 이 러브라는 감정이 그 어떤 음식보다도 어, nutritious, 영양가 있다고 라고 말씀을 하셨는데, 이 사랑이라는 감정이 여러, 거, 여러 감정을 포괄할 수도 있겠지만, 이것이 혼자만의 어떤 감정이 아니라 상호작용 의 감정이기 때문에 내가 러브라는 감정을 느끼고 있어도 그게 불가능할 때가 있을 수도 있는데 그때는 어떻게 해야 될까요? 라는 그 질문에 대해서 여쭤보도록 하겠습니다. I think that's a really good point about how uh, love as an interpersonal experience does require that there's mutuality, that there's kind of synchrony and, and caring involved. And in fact, what I've argued in my book, Love 2.0, and in uh, most of my research in the last five years has focused on this concept of positivity resonance, that it, this is not a state that's limited to our, the people in our inner circle, our, our romantic partners, spouses, or family members. Positivity resonance can be experienced at work, with strangers, acquaintances, and those interactions with what sociologists have called weak ties, these more distant people in our social lives, um, contribute quite a bit to well being. They help us know that we're safe in our communities. And that I think has a biological, my hypothesis is that feeling safe in your communities is something that it um, uh, builds from our past history of 
these um, warm, connected moments. They're very subtle. They don't, people ordinarily wouldn't call them love, but they have the same structure. They have the same co-experience, positive emotions, even at a subtle level. Those end up being tremendously important for people's mental health, as well as the degree to which they are kind and caring and look out for others. We just published a paper to show that people who have more of these shared experiences with strangers and acquaintances and close loved ones are more likely to um, feel that during this pandemic, we're all in it together and you know we need to protect each other and we need to wear masks and socially distance um, from one another. You know, in the United States, we've had a hard time following public health recommendations. We are not a country where people like to be told what to do. And so it's very important in a culture like ours to understand what are people's personal motivations for taking care to protect other people's health um, because we have to rely on those motivations a lot. 기쁨은 나누면 두 배로 두고 슬픔은 나누면 반으로 줄어든다는 그런 교수님의 말씀이 참 와닿는 것 같습니다. 어 그리고 또 다른 질문이 있는데요. 어 우리가 긍정적인 어떤 감정에 집중할 수도 있지만 살면서 우리는 항상 부정적인 감정도 무시할 수는 없는데 물론 그쪽 긍정적으로 프라이어리타이즈 할 수는 있지만 네가티브 감정도 우리가 이그노어 하거나 아니면 서프레스 하면 언젠가 터질 것 같은데 이런 부정적인 감정을 효과적으로 어, 릴리즈 배출할 수 있는 방법은 없을까요, 교수님? 라고 질문이 왔습니다. Right, great question. I, um, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start the talk like I did was to recognize that negative emotions are, are real. They're um, sometimes very appropriate to the situations that we're in. Um, negative emotions become unhealthy when they become decontextualized or they become um, uh, kind of disconnected from our current circumstances, lasting longer than our circumstances would typically warrant. We perseverate on them. Um, and I, I like the saying that you uh, mentioned about um, having the negativity by connecting with others. Um, I think the thing to do is to not suppress negative emotions. In fact, the best science suggests that accepting our negative emotions is what helps us move through them quicker. And the greater acceptance of negative emotions is why older individuals tend to be happier than younger individuals, at least in the US, in the US samples. But it's, I think it's part of the wisdom of aging that we kind of accelerate that wisdom with meditation practice. We, um, we learn to accept our emotional states, that um, equanimity and openness. That is um, something that isn't saying push that away. You're not trying to push away the negative. You're just like, ah, that's anxiety. <laughs> that's anger. You're able to note it. And as we note it, 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 minim it becomes um, minimized. Um, uh, there's really good neuroscience that suggests that when we're able to label our emotions, put a word on them, negative emotions become diminished. If we get analytical about our positive emotions, they also get diminished. The thing to do with positive emotions is kind of immerse yourself in them and savor them. And that allows them to stay at a higher level. So it's a matter of not of um, shooing the negative emotions away, but rather learning to self-generate positive emotions so that in our whole day, we have, um, sources of positivity to lift us up and help us get over those sources of difficulty. So it's not about making negative emotions go away. It's just meeting them with more resources. 
교수님의 답변이 저희가 불교 법문에서 듣는 어떤 것과 비슷한 것 같은데요. 우리가 긍정적인 감정도 있지만 부정적인 감정이 있을 때 그것을 사라지게 하려고 없애려고 하는 것이 아니라 있는 그대로 인정하는 것, acknowledge 하는 것이 도움이 된다고 교수님께서 답변을 해주셨습니다. 어, 그러면 또 다른 질문으로 가도록 하겠습니다. 자, 우리가 이런 말이 있잖아요. 내가 행복하지 않아도 일부러 웃어서 웃음 근육을 일 움직여 주게 되면 우리의 뇌는 행복하다고 느끼게 된다고 하잖아요. 근데 여기 계시는 질문자 중에 한 분은 매일 아침 일어날 때보다 나는 행복해 행복해 괜찮을 거야 라고 다짐을 하는데 교수님 설명을 듣다 보니 어, 그 파지티브 긍정적인 것을 익스피리언스 하는 거랑 포스 하는 거 강압하는 거는 차이가 있다고 하셨는데 저는 왠지 저에게 강압을 하는 것 같아요 라고 질문을 주셨어요. 어떻게 하면 강압된 어떤 긍정이 아니라 느껴지는 긍정이 될수 있을까요, 교수님? Yeah. That's a really good question. There is a phrase in the in English, um, fake it till you make it, and it's usually re referred to with smiling, like smile until you make it. And the the thing that I think is important about that phrase is until you make it. <laughs> that we can jumpstart a positive, a genuine positive emotion by starting by smiling or you know, relaxing our bodies, carrying ourselves in a way that is um, more like a happy person does. <laughs> that um, sometimes moving in a, in a happier way or showing it on our faces can be Uh, the doorway into a genuine experience. In the same way, thoughts can do that. Um, thinking positive thoughts can do that. Um, but we, we should not mistake those doorways for the positive emotion because um, think of them as like kindling you know sometimes you rub two sticks together nothing will happen and another time there'll be a spark and a fire so the the posture the face the thoughts can sometimes trigger positive emotions so the key is to use your mindful awareness to notice what happens next when you think a certain thing like What in my day is a gift that I can treasure? And if you do that in a way that touches your heart and kind of not doesn't just stay up here in your brain, but affects your whole body and your relaxed way of being in the world, then we know a genuine emotion has started. So it's okay to use these shortcuts. It's just that you don't want to stay in the trigger. <laughs> you want to see if it became um, genuine. Now, there, there's a great need for equanimity here because just because we intend to feel good doesn't mean that we will. We have to look at it as, as an open question. I'm trying to feel better. Am I really feeling better? Is it, does this, Am I, am, does I, do I feel it in my full body? Your body's less tricky. Your mind is tricky <laughs> and can, um, you know, come sometimes convince you, you must be happy. But if it doesn't kind of show up in other ways, um, then it may, it may not be as, as deep seated as you were hoping for it to be. I'm going to. 끝까지 계속 지속적으로 하는 게 중요한 것 같습니다. 자 그리고 또 다른 캐스, 어, 질문이 있는데요. 자 교수님께서 어, 발표하실 때두 가지 명상법을 소개해 주셨어요. Mindful meditation이랑 loving and kind meditation 두 가지가 자주 나왔었는데 어, 명상에도 여러 가지 종류가 있다는 게 신기하고 특히 이두 명상이 어떻게 다른지 비슷한지 그리고 어떤 차이 때문에 mindful meditation이 조금 더 효과가 있게 나왔는지 그 부분에 대해서 설명해 주시겠어요? 라고 질문이 올라왔습니다. Yeah, I would say um, 
in many traditional Buddhist teachings, you would learn both loving kindness and mindfulness as part of an integrated holistic practice. We scientists in the West are really keen on splitting things apart. So people who are, who are teaching from a traditional Buddhist approach may be using both of these, but in the wet, the kinds of the first meditation practices that um, were seriously taken up in a non-religious way in the U.S. were all focused on training attention. And my personal take on this is that that matched the science of psychology at the time which had just begun a cognitive revolution where we could go past behaviorism, where only action mattered, to thinking about how thoughts and attention matter. But it was still a decade away before scientists would touch emotions, would ever um, do rigorous work on emotions. And so I think as American psychological scientists began studying meditation, they picked a meditation practice that fit with the zeitgeist of the science at the time, which was to look at cognitive psychology, thinking patterns and attention. And so mindfulness um, uh, practice, shamatha, holding, holding um, attention steady um, became a big focus. And it was only about 10 or 15 years later that compassion meditation and loving kindness meditation because they were focused on cultivating subtle positive emotional states became also a focus of the science. And then when somebody like me wants to compare one, you know, a, an emotion based practice to a practice that sounds less emotional, I wanted to try to keep those practices apart. Now they aren't, in our studies, they're not even 100% um, different from one another because as the meditation instructors will tell me that in mindfulness practice, as you recognize that your attention has strayed from the breath or whatever the focal object was, it's a gesture of loving kindness to be able to come back to your focus without berating yourself, without being critical of oneself that just being kind to yourself as you realize you didn't meet your attention. So there's a, there's a piece of um, accept openness and caring for the self that comes in there. And then being able to steady your attention is the, of mindfulness, a mindfulness skill is really critical within loving kindness as you try to keep your attention on the phrases. So um, I think it's possible that in, um, uh, American and Western psychology, we've kind of pulled these practices apart when in reality in our real lives, it's better if they're braided together because they're, we need attention skills and we need heart practices, um, compassion and warmth. And so um, I do think that um, uh, the best kinds of practices would um, integrate them. There are beginning to be some studies uh, that um, really look at the pieces of meditation and what happens if we leave one thing out. Like if we leave acceptance out of mindfulness practice, do we get as much benefit? Turns out we don't acceptance is really key. And as I mentioned earlier, acceptance of negative emotions is what helps us move through them faster, not sweep them away, but just not perseverate in them. So um, I'm hoping that in the future we'll have uh, studies that look at what's the benefit of learning loving kindness and mindfulness together in a balanced way.
일단은 두 가지 다른 게 있더라도 통합적으로 하는 것이 더 좋고 미래에 그런 연구가 있었으면 좋겠다고 교수님께서 답변해 주셨습니다. 네, 아직도 많은 질문이 남아 있지만 시간 관계상 질의 응답을 종료해야 되는데 마지막 질문 딱한 개만 드리고 가겠습니다. Yes or No로 답해 주시면 되는 겁니다. 자, 교수님께서는 명상에 대해서 많은 연구를 해 오셨는데 교수님 본인은 매일매일 명상을 수행하십니까? Yes or No? Not every day, no. <웃음> Um, there, I fall off the cushion a lot, and I try to begin again a lot. But thank you for the question. 네, 오늘 이렇게 늦은 시간임에도 불구하고 끝까지 어, 이렇게 참석해 주셔서 다시 한번 더 감사드리겠습니다. 자, 그러면 우리는 지금부터 앞으로 간 어, 점심 시간을 가지고 다시 이부 세션에서 여러분들과 만나 뵙도록 하겠습니다. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and Q&A session.